thatgreatbusinessshow.com is brought to you by de facto shaving oil the best anyone can get made in Ireland sold worldwide Welcome to episode 17 of thatgreatbusinessshow.com Ireland's best business podcast first published on the 15th of January 2021 I am Connell O'Moran This week, one of our guests will explain how the absence of a good ice cream van drove him to build a business making food trailers in Wicklow, now exporting to the US and Eastern Europe. He'll tell us his tricks on how he has used online marketing to access those markets. A Carlo-based entrepreneur tells us about the 20 or so jobs she had before she found and founded her first love, her skincare company that exports around the world, most recently opening up the South Korean market, and she explains how she does all of this with herself and just two others. And if you want to win at the tendering game, here or abroad, we have a brilliant hack for you. That Great Business Show has found a fabulous early stage business that hired very young college students to crack the tendering code. And it works. That same business now wants to raise €4 million. Find out what they want to use it for. All of this and more on That Great Business Show. And normally at this point I would introduce my sidekick, co-presenter and better half, former rugby player and current entrepreneur, Jamie Heaslip. But Jamie can't make it this week. And of course, to say stay from COVID, some of our interviews this week are via Zoom. And that really great reaction to both Tony Smurfett on episode 14 and to Conor McEnroy on episode 15 continues. My thanks to journalists Ian Guider and Barry White, who picked up the stories from the Business Post. We appreciate the publicity. And remember, past shows are always available on your favourite podcast platform. Finally, That Great Business Show is only possible thanks to our sponsor, DeFactoShave.com. They want you to change your ways in 2021. Put away those polluting cans of shaving foam and use Mayo Made De Facto. De Facto is a totally new skincare product created from a blend of 100% natural oils, which virtually eliminates shaving discomforts like nicks, cuts, raw skin and razor burn. One 50ml bottle of de facto lasts a year. It's the best anyone can get. And so, let us open up shop on that great business show. And who better to start with this week but Joe Brown of the eponymously named business Joe Brown Luxury Products. I had a great chat with Joe a few days ago to learn about her business. And two of my big takeaways were, typical of SMEs around the country, how incredibly incredibly hard she works. And secondly, she must be Princess Pivot as she's had, she reckons, 20 jobs before she set up her own company based in Hackettstown in County Carlow. It's from there she makes her own perfumes <clears throat> along with other skincare products. And most recently she started selling bamboo bed linen. In Ireland, she's well supported by the Kilkenny Shops, Blarney Woollen Mills, Foxford Woollen Mills and Meadows and Burn. But that's just Ireland. Her markets are worldwide and I was intrigued when she told me she had just opened up the South Korean market. Joe Brown joins me now via Zoom from Carlo. Welcome to thatgreatbusinessshow.com, Joe. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And what an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's your story. Yeah. Not alone is it intriguing. It's, it kind of made me tired almost when you told me how hard you work. So how hard do you work? Uh, we, we work very hard. Um, we start about nine in the morning as soon as the kids are gone to school. And we usually finish about 12 at night. Um, we do that seven days a week. Um, it's just the way it is at the moment. And you just have to keep going. We take a few hours off during the day. Um, I suppose dinner time and stuff like that. And then start again at six. Joe, um, Joe, you're allowed to eat. It's not, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> if you don't yeah, eat, say there's no me, business. <laughs> but this is, I thrive on it. I love it. I thrive on it. I want to be, I never thought I was like this, but I, it's not, you just want to be more successful and more successful, I think. Um, it's how big you can get. Um, I think that's anyone that works for themselves. Um, I could stop now and be happy with my sales and be contented. But I don't want to. I want to see how big I can grow this business. Which is fantastic. Now, you had 
you reckon, 20 jobs before you founded the business. We Absolutely. love a good pivot, but not a pivot, 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 pivot. What kind of jobs were you doing? Oh, well, I started work when I was 13. I mean, there were seven of us, uh, my mom and dad, they would have owned their own business. And I always, I suppose, looked at how hard they worked. Um, we weren't handed money like the way, I suppose, kids are handed money nowadays. So I started working in the local news agents when I was 13. Um, I remember I used to get a pound an hour. It seems like years ago, but it was a pound an hour. And um, I never not worked a day in my life. Um, I worked with Oral Flame. I worked knocking on doors. I worked as secretarial. I done payroll. I worked in the civil service. I've worked in a chipper. I've worked in a pub. Uh, I've worked in Intel. I mean, <laughs> I've worked at something, but I, do you know what? I, I worked as a chef actually as well at one stage. I was never, I suppose, contented in any job. Um, I always see, I suppose I always seen things could have been done better and easier, but um, I never got that opportunity. So I always swore to myself that someday I will own my own business and be successful. And why um, the perfume business? And that's only just part of the business, yeah. I know, but just to simplify it, why yeah. perfumes? Yeah, well, I suppose I was never great in school. I was okay. I tried my best, but look, I was never over intelligent, I suppose. Um, no, but no, no, I, I, I won't. I won't let that go unchallenged. <laughs> you may not have been academically intelligent. Yeah, I mean, people, I done my best. I studied probably ten times harder yeah. than everybody else. When people but, hear what you've yeah. done with your business, they're just going to go, "Oh my God, she's one bright lady." Continue. Well, yeah, I suppose anyone that works on themselves will think differently. They just don't think straight like other people. They'll think up, they'll think down, they'll think different obstacles. Um, so I suppose it was, I, I loved solid perfume. Um, I always wore solid perfume. I never, ever wore spray perfume. Um, I just always found it too overpowering, too harsh. Just never liked it. Um, in 2014, I was a reflexologist as well. <laughs> um I just couldn't get solid perfume anymore. I was actually importing it from Australia and that lady had stopped making it. And I just said, God, do you know how hard could it be to make a solid perfume? So um, I made myself one, but I wasn't happy with the packaging or anything like that. And then that's how I discovered bamboo. So we're the first company in Ireland, the UK, to use bamboo as our packaging. Now, we didn't launch till 2016 and little did I know that I thought I would be only doing local trade shows or local shows or markets. I never dreamt of what could happen in 2017 to me. Uh, 2017, we won the Bank of Ireland Startup Award. We won the RSVP Award. We won the Carlo Chamber Award. We won the gift show for the best gift category in, in showcase. So that all happened when the company was like six months old. So I knew then I had something successful. And that's how I got into the Kilkenny shops. I suppose then once I got into Kilkenny shops, it opened the doors for all the other shops for me. Um, but the problem was um, at that stage, we didn't have enough uh, shelf space. So that's why we started developing more products. And when you mention all those awards, we are huge proponents. Uh, we love people to enter those awards because it might take you an hour or something to fill in the form, but the publicity can be magnificent. And you've just proven that point. Take, for example, the Bank of Ireland Award. What did that mean to you? Oh, I was shaken. <laughs> I had to go to, because I'm not, I, I, I am a people's person, but like I'm not overconfident. So I went on my own up to Dublin, up to the Mansion House, and I remember two people beforehand telling me, now you might come third this year, next year you might come second, and, and the year after you might win. And I said, I'm going to show them, and I won it. I love <laughs> yeah. that. Ah, oh, you um, got so much like, grit. Yeah, yeah. They had put me down even before the awards were announced, and I was like, on my own, and uh, yeah, I won it. I, yeah, it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Went to the local pub on the way home, and sure was great. <laughs> <laughs> now, the yeah. team, you have not got a massive team. Absolutely, we don't. We had five. Um, and then with COVID, obviously, we had lost some staff. We'd lost our girl on the road. Um, and then we had lost another girl as well because our premises wouldn't be huge. And also, it's right beside the house. So it's just too close to home, really. Um, but it didn't make much of a difference because we've lost someone on the road. But look, at the shops don't want people calling in anyway, salespeople calling in. Um 
we have another girl that works from home. She does all our online orders for us and we collect them every evening from her. Um, hence, that's why we work till probably 12 o'clock at night. Well, sorry, um, just talk me through that because a lot of people would be interested in that, how that actually works. Yeah, so all the online yeah. orders come in um, and we have then Anya. Anya's with us from the start and she would do all the labels, then the Fastway labels in her house. Um, and then we, we pick them up from her every evening, all the labels. It's it's a process in itself when you have online orders. You have to print the order, go in, do the label, come back, fill the box. You know, uh, if someone wants a, a note or anything, that has to be done. So it's very time consuming, uh, but it's brilliant, obviously. And what would typically be an order? Are we talking about 20 euro or 40 no, euro or 60 no, euro? No, our average order is 120 euros. Oh, that's decent. That is good. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really, really good. Um, we have free shipping over €30, Euros, so that would make people spend €30. Um, we could have done it over 50 but we just thought it was too much. So €30, we can, we can do it. We can do it over €30. Um, and I think people like free shipping, don't they? I do. Well, I certainly do, and I think it's very... Yeah. I mean, I know it's. I'm being caught somewhere in the price, but it looks, it looks but, good to me anyway. Yeah, well, I suppose the thing is they can buy a bamboo face cloth for like €7, Euros and that'll been up the price another little bit. Or, um, so, like, the business is four years... In, we're four years in business, and we have kind of four categories at the moment. Um, our, our first category would be skincare, all our skincare. Our second category would be body care, which, which we just launched this year. Our third category would be the bamboo diffuser and all our blends, which is a huge seller for us. And then our four categories are bamboo bedding. So with the bamboo bedding, we do bamboo face cloths. We do bamboo remover pads, which we only launched this year as well. So to be honest with you, the 2019 or 2020 was, um, we launched six products in 2020 over COVID. Um, so that's quite amazing, you know. Um, well, do you know what's equally amazing? Because I try to keep the uh, the good wine to last. Tell me about <laughs> tell me about all of the markets that you are serving, and we'll get to South Korea eventually. But talk okay. me through. You obviously launch in Ireland. Then what? Yes. Yeah. So we launched in Ireland, and then we would have got in the American shops. We did a show in America as well. Hang on. Um, now you just didn't happen to get into America. How did that happen? Um, we did a show. We did an Irish show in um, America 2019 and we got, would have got shops from there. Uh, we did showcase in Ireland. So that happens in January every year in the RDS where buyers come in from all over the world and looks at uh, look at Irish producers. Um, so we would have picked up a couple of shops there from Canada as well. Um, we have sockets in Switzerland. We have... Um, we're on a website, an Austrian website, is Ecoverb. So Ecoverb would sell all over Europe. So they would buy quite a lot from us. It used to be every two months, every month. Now they're ordering it like every week from us. So it's really, really, really good. It's opened the European market for us. Um, yeah, so it's all good. Uh, we have a stockist in Australia as well. and But we know we could do better. We know we could do better and uh, we will. And how are you going to do better? Um, I suppose when traveling is back again, like we were offered a huge market in Turkey um, with Coca-Cola, which is really nuts. And no, well, um, again, yeah, it is yeah. so nuts that I'm trying to think, what has skincare <laughs> got to do with Coca-Cola? Yeah, well, see what happened. Um, the it's kind of he's the managing director of Coca-Cola was in the Kenny shop in Dublin, and he picked up my perfumes, and he went back to Turkey with them. And he just thought this was amazing. And the thing was that I sent him over loads of products and we had a couple of Zoom meetings. But the problem was they didn't know how to sell cosmetics in Turkey. <laughs> and um, and but, I suppose then COVID came and that's kind of maybe destroyed it all. But we will start it again soon enough. We needed someone in Turkey to help us. But, um, but you're hardly but he, selling through the Coca-Cola network, are you? Um, I don't know. Like they had lots of money and lots of plans for us. But, okay, um, well, then you keep talking. Yeah, <laughs> so we we will keep talking. Yeah, it was just that we needed someone in Turkey that could speak Turkish to help us get our cosmetics kind of safety assessed in Turkey. But um, we we'll work on it again. We we were not going to say no to it. Still, like obviously, we'll keep keep at it. And what you do sell has to be assessed, as you just mentioned there. And it took you. And I, I still wonder about why South Korea. I did look it up. There are 50 million people there, so that's a good reason. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And it took you eight months, was it, to get clearance? 
Oh no, it, it, it took two years altogether. Wow. Yeah, it's it's a really slow process. Um, and it's done properly in South Korea. There's no messing in South Korea. Nothing enters South Korea unless it's completely stripped back, completely stripped back. Um, even the bamboo is analysed. Everything is analysed, which is good because once you get in, then you're in, you know. Um, they've taken the perfumes, they've taken the cleansing balm, the face cloth, the diffusers have just got passed and this, the blends for the diffuser have just got passed. So they just do one product at a time because it costs a lot of money. Um, and once that's satisfied, then they, they order a, a big amount. So we've been shipping over to them for the last year. And again, no problems at all shipping? Would you, no, would you, no, would you no do problems. pallet loads the, or do you do yeah. container loads? No, what, usually just DHL or whatever like that. They look after everything once it hits South Korea. I don't have to worry once it leaves my door. And which is good. How again did you think of or come across South Korea? Again, they were in Dublin in Kilkenny in Nasa Street. <laughs> Sounds and like you should. The product. <laughs> you should just set up a little uh, booth there and do nothing else. Yeah, I think I should have. I think like we send our products all over the world all the time, um, and I suppose you don't know who's getting them at the other end, do you? No, you, you don't. And that's a very fair point. Yeah, you just don't know. So every package has to be right and correct. Um, like every package goes out here, there's a lot of love in it, but that way. <laughs> you and what, know, you, what you haven't um, mentioned is that you are actually yeah. manufacturing your product in Hackettstown, in yeah. Carlow, by yeah. yourselves. Because many of the people we talk to, understandably, what they are, they're a marketing operation and they are getting yeah. their product elsewhere and repackaging it or whatever. Absolutely. Yours is yeah, from ground up. Yeah, so that's up. really important about our company and it's, it's very important. Um, we have no cosmetic chemists with us. I develop everything through research, like research. I research day and night and I love it. I I, I, I just love it. We're la- launching another skincare product in about three months time. We're just finalizing the last bit of it. Um, well, we are. I mean, I, <laughs> I always say we, but it takes six, eight months to develop a product because now it has to be safety assessed, obviously, at the end of the day, like we were safety assessed in the UK Um you have to have your papers to sell and then you're, you're put on the European portal. So every product we launch would have papers with them. Um, but it's very important to say that I develop the products and we then hand make and hand pour every product. Um, it's only lately we've bought in one or two machines. We have bought in um, like a filling machine or a label machine. Um, you know, it had to be done, but everything is handmade with love. Yes. And you say about the UK assessment... Yeah. What will Brexit mean for that? Because they're that's, not going to obviously yes. cover Europe anymore. Yes, that's very, 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 I shouldn't have said that. But yeah, mm. it's very true. Um, it's one market I probably have never opened is the UK market. Really? Why yeah. not? Why not? Because we're, we never did a show over there. We but never. Did they did not come into the Kilkenny shop? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure yet. they do. But <laughs> I said if I am going to go to the UK, I'll start at the highest and work down. Um, and I always said that I'd start at the highest end shop I can get into. But no, we've never really cracked the, the UK market, uh, but we've never tried. Well, we, we really operate a kind of a team system here on the That Great Business Show. So you are now part of Team GBS. But so is a woman called Mina Rust, and she okay. makes Mina's Nougat. And Mina's Nougat is in Harrods. And I know, because I've already asked her, is that Mina will introduce other people to Harrods if you ask her. So you look up Mina's Nougat, and yeah. from Harrods, that brought her up in thinking to the Nordic countries and, and, and. So it is a fabulous showcase to get into Harrods. Okay, well, that's where I'll start. As I said, I'll, I'll start at the top and work down. Um, no, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love that. Um, I don't know why we have never, I suppose my company is only four years old, so I can't, uh, we've kind of gone into America and Canada and a couple of places, been busy enough and the UK is just never, like we have a couple of shops in the UK, don't get me wrong, and we send a lot of parcels to the UK, but we've never really cracked the UK. And in the US, so, are you picking up on Irish America or is it anybody or do you know? Um, I don't really know. Um, you'd know by the surname. Sometimes you go, oh, yeah. that's an Irish person living in America. Yeah. or uh, And then there's, no, there's really odd names. <laughs> the Obamas weren't on to you, no. 
No, not yet. Not yet. Not the yet. Biden, not Joe yet. Biden might be a uh, male yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. That he is. <laughs> uh, back to how many actual countries you are selling into. You've got a big number, haven't you? Yeah, we do. We've about 12. Okay. Yeah. And there are three of you uh, trying to service that market. Absolutely. You, and you've got big ambitions. How are you going yes. to get to that point? Well, we do have, like, I mean, we do have like a girl that works locally that does all our design for us. I mean, we have the the accountant that comes in once a month. We have our website guy. So there's all these outer companies we use as well, you know, for design, for Instagram and website help and stuff. Like we do use other companies to help us. Um, we've, we've four ways at the moment. Now we had more, we had six. Okay, so, but that's understandable with COVID. Yeah, because but we know it's January now. Or we're, like, we're not slow. We're still bloody flat out the door. Like, we launched our hand sanitizer last January. And like at last January, we were selling a 1,000 bottles a day. Now, that's probably gone down to about maybe 300 bottles a day, you know. But yeah, but we know we could be so much bigger. Like, we've just launched our bamboo bedding. It's one of a kind. It's a 400 thread count We've got into Foxford, Woolen Mills with it, Meadows and Burns. We've just launched into Kilkenny with it. Um, but we're the first of its kind in the UK and Ireland for bamboo bedding. So we know this market could be gigantic for us. And is there anything that Team GBS, the great, that great business show team, can we do anything for you? Are you trying to raise funds or are you looking for people to open markets for you? I'm definitely looking for people to open markets for me. Um We've never really got a loan. We've just worked on our own. Um, we've worked on our own takings, like. Um, but we've turned over maybe three, four times more than we did last year. Oh, my so our turnover God. Is quite that is big. fantastic. Um, but w- I suppose we use up the money we turn over straight away to buy more. But the only thing I found this year, this January, is now we're able to buy large amounts of containers. Where before we were only buying a thousand here and a thousand there and... When they were gone, you buy another thousand. But this time, I'm able to buy a massive bulk in, which obviously uh, helps the uh, the profit margin. Yeah, well, it definitely helps the profit profit margin. Plus, we can send them with slow boat and not with DHL Express, or you know, you're saving so much money there. Um, a b- massive big difference when you have the money to buy in bulk. And you know? if I were um, if I were to talk to you again, say at the end of this year. Yeah. What will you have achieved? Because I don't even have to ask you, do you think you will? I know you will. What do you think you'll have achieved by then? Oh, we'll be in Harrods, definitely. <laughs> Maybe Macy's as well. <laughs> I, I think Macy's is gone. I can't remember. I think, oh, I think Macy's, Macy's gone. I think Macy's went bust about a year oh, ago. Did it? Well, okay, but I better be careful. Macy's. If, if Macy's, if you're not bust, I'm sorry, but uh, I think you may be. But we're definitely, yeah, well, Harrods is still there. And we the will get Ni- uh, Mina, um, Mina Rust of Mina's Nuga to get on to you. Uh, yeah, we'll, that'd we'll be amazing. Up, and we'll get you in there. Then we can, you will come back mm. to us. Your story, as usual, on that great business show, Joe Brown, is quite amazing. Anybody Thank who you. wants to find you finds you at Joe Brown. Dot com, isn't that it? Yeah, that's correct. Simple as and a wonderful Simple name. Simple as. Thank you so much. <laughs> Joe Brown, thank you very much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thank you. That Great Business Show dot com is sponsored by de facto shave dot com. They back us, we back you. So please, you back them and buy the world's best shaving oil today. De facto shaving oil is available online at defactoshave.com and delivered worldwide. You're listening to That Great Business Show with Cunnel Moron and Jamie Heaslip. ThatGreatBusinessShow.com And we are committed to gender balance on ThatGreatBusinessShow.com. We normally have an equal number of men and women entrepreneurs on the show, though COVID has meant we're unfortunately making an exception today. If you'd like your business featured on That Great Business Show, particularly if it's a woman-founded or led business, please tell us about it by clicking the Share Your Story button on our website, ThatGreatBusinessShow.com, where you'll see what kinds of businesses we are looking out for. However, we do get a lot of requests each week and we do respond to them all eventually. So please be patient with us. Now, I love those business stories where someone wants a product or a service, sees it's no good or not available, so they set it up themselves. A lad called Thomas Ward owned an ice cream kiosk on Wicklow's Bray Seafront, but he wanted to go further, as people in business often want to do, and he searched and he searched 
and he searched for a catering vehicle that would showcase his products. There was nothing that would suit his needs available in Ireland or in the UK, so he had a chat with the brother. The brother in this case is Kevin Ward, who was working with multinationalindeed.com at that time. He did his own research and agreed there was a nice big gap in the market. He quit his job. Indeed, he did. Sorry, I couldn't resist that one. And he set up Reward Catering in Rathnew, County Wicklow. It's a great business story as they now make and sell their gorgeous and I mean really gorgeous, retro-style Airstream around the world from the US to Australia. And if you love your big, blousy American cars like I do, you'll drool at their catering vans. Kevin Ward, founder of Reward Catering, thank you so much for joining us by Zoom on That Great Business Show. Hi, Conal. Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks for having me on the show. It's great. Oh, well, listen... I am, you've got me once I saw the photographs of the uh, catering um, uh, trailers. They are just so gorgeous. And for people who don't know what an Airstream is, it's the one you've seen in the 1950s movies from the US, all chrome and the kind of thing you'd always wanted to have in Ireland. But we, I don't think anybody ever brought them in here, did they? Um, so you would have originally had, you know, some people importing the original Airstreams and retrofitting them and re- refurbishing them. And um, so you would see a few of them around. But I suppose, um, I suppose that's 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 how we ended up in the market because the the hassle of importing a unit and retrofitting and trying to get it to the correct way that you want finished, it's just an awful lot of work and it's also massively expensive. So I suppose that's kind of the area we looked at in the beginning, um, and it just wasn't feasible. Um, there was nowhere that you could really locate them in Ireland. The UK was just bringing them from America and doing all the changes, which, um, yeah, that's how we started the idea. And you're sitting in Indeed.com, which is a digital business. And it's such a change from that into manufacturing vans or trailers or both those two words don't actually do justice to them because uh, they are really uh, gorgeous. Thanks again. Yeah, I suppose it was a, it's a, a real breath of fresh air. It's probably the best decision I've ever made, just in terms of, um, I suppose I was doing sales all my life. Still, still majority focused on sales in the company here. That's my kind of forte. But I suppose just uh, getting out of the office and you know being able to change it around from looking at the process and the manufacturing side rather than being stuck on in the desk all day every day. It's so a great, great benefits in terms of your own kind of mental health and your own kind of uh, goals going forward. So it was a real, real, real great change that, we, that I decided to make, you know. But it's a huge change. And what the hell did you know about manufacturing a van before you started manufacturing a van? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Please don't tell me you saw it on YouTube. I've just been recently watching so many people, you know, repairing or even building their homes based on <laughs> YouTube. And I'm sure they're all going to fall down again uh, because the YouTube will be sued. Did you look at a YouTube about uh, building a van? No. So we would have actually um, visited um, quite a number of different kind of manufacturers across Europe, Asia. Um, so we kind of spent a full year doing research and development. And so the whole, I suppose, 2016, 17, we spent about a year, year and a half doing research and development. So it was looking at, you know, what stages of the manufacturing process could we do ourselves? You know, where do we need experts to, to, to lend the hand? And so I suppose we kind of felt, found the right balance. But when you were looking at manufacturing, I find it hard to believe that any manufacturer allowed you in to see their production lines or their processes because that is um, effectively that you're you're a cuckoo in their nest <laughs> absolutely um i suppose it's the same with ourselves here you do uh, you do get a lot of customers who i suppose aren't as uh, uh, customers really and um, are always trying to find out how you're doing things um but i suppose the, the main process that we did was um we bring in a, a large portion of our units and um, we bring in some sections from germany some sections from asia um, and it's kind of getting them designed and built from the start in the factories that we visited and um, so it was more of a of finding the manufacturers to, to to put something in process for ourselves so we weren't actually looking at trailer manufacturers we were looking at manufacturers that were able to put uh, 
manufacture different components of the trailer. I'm with you. I understand now. So now that's given me a great idea of how to uh, spy on on others. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and what you're doing is you are putting t- together the parts. Is that it? Yeah, absolutely. So in Rat New here, um, we have six, a team of six people at the moment. We actually are just receiving the keys for a new premises in Ballymount tomorrow. And Congratulations. Well done, you. That's Thanks Ballymount in Dublin for anybody who doesn't know that. So are you moving out of Wicklow? Well, for the for the first, I suppose, the whole of 21, we're probably going to keep boat locations uh, just so everything is up and running smoothly in boat. Um, the new unit in Ballymount is it's just under 8,000 square foot. Um, so it's quite, quite a large unit compared to what we have here. It'll allow us to increase our production capacity and then we're also going to be putting in a two-story showroom, uh, which is going to be really, really cool. Um, so hopefully we'll be launching in there towards the end of March, uh, all depending on getting all the correct works done. So it's quite exciting at the moment. And for anybody who wants to know what exactly your uh, vans, trailers uh, are used for, I see cocktail bars, gin bars, Prosecco bars, coffee trailers, pizza trailers, mobile hairdressers, mobile kitchens, corporate branded units, etc., cetera, et cetera, Because I also saw a lovely video. You were putting it in, not for Facebook. Who are you putting it in for uh, up at the IFSC? Um, one of our clients there would have been DocuSign. So we That's worked it. with That's the one, yeah. Yeah. and Henny J. Lyons. And we actually installed a unit in their office block, their first floor of their office block in the final stages of their construction project. So that act, that unit actually sits there uh, forever, um, hopefully. Um, and it just allows the staff to, to grab a nice cup of coffee, but in a kind of luxurious way. So that's a really cool unit that was fitted out using a uh, Cosentino Silstone. Um, really, really elegant. It's nice. So we kind of start with units for, we've kind of seen a large increase now in the last couple of months with clients who maybe have always worked you know in a bar restaurant and kind of lost their job obviously with the pandemic um and have just kind of decided to make that step to opening up their own business and i suppose the most cost effective way you know you can put 60 70 80 thousand euro into a into a restaurant into a kitchen and then you're stuck in kind of bricks and mortar uh, which isn't obviously working you know they're all shut down i thought with the pandemic so i think people are looking at the most cost effective way um, and it's something that they can move to their customers as opposed to waiting the customers come. So we have a, a lot of clients now in the last couple of months that are just starting out in business for the first time. Whereas over the last kind of number of years, we do work with really, really large corporate clients as well who expand their outdoor offering. Um, so we have worked with a lot of really good hotel groups. We have a unit in Harrods of London and that's a pretty cool project as well. That was all pink. And now, it was in collaboration. There's a question for you because... I have an idea how you've done this. How did you get into Harrods? Um, so it would have been a collaboration with EL and N Cafe. Um, they're based in London. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. I am so. not at all. Never heard of them. I, I, I only heard of them because my uh, my fiance um, is on Instagram and, and, and loves liking all these photos and pictures and showed me. So when the client rang, I was familiar with them already. <laughs> Um, so they are a cafe and it's all about their Instagram. They bring in fresh flowers every day. Um, all their coffees are pink. Flowers are pink. Their whole brand is pink. So they were doing a collaboration with Harrods. Um, and they got in touch with ourselves. Um, you know, over a number of months, we kind of put together some concept designs and they were happy to move forward with that. So they actually have two units, one for Harrods and one for. I think it's um, Blue Water Shopping Centre in London, maybe. I'm not. Well, maybe. let me go back again because I'm still finding it hard to believe that by com- was it complete chance that your fiance is following them on Instagram and they worked it backwards to you? I I, I can't follow that one. No, no, sorry. Um, so they would have actually just reached out. I believe it would have been on the knock on effect of the DocuSign project that we done. Ah, okay. So it would have been with a architect firm in the UK. Can't think of their names right now, but they would have probably got our details from Henry J. Lyons. Okay, all right. And Be- it was just when um, I was just saying, I, I was quite familiar with their brand because of my fiance liked them on Instagram. Now I'm caught up with you. Okay, <laughs> because you do, because you've already told me this, an awful lot of online marketing. Absolutely. Yes. So I, I suppose it's quite key um, to what we do, especially with 
you know, the different international markets that we work with. I suppose the majority of it would all be down. It's a family run business. So Thomas and uh, my brother with the ice cream kiosk in Bray, he is also a, I suppose, a bit of a tech wizard. So he's worked with the likes of Microsoft and Oracle. And um, so he looks after everything online for us, our SEO, our marketing, our branding. And he does just an amazing job of constantly bringing in the leads and, the, and, and connecting us with the right kind of clientele across the world. It's a phenomenal job because I did chat to you to find out how in the name of the Lord do people in Malta, Germany, Latvia, Portugal, USA, Australia find you? And it is down a good deal, if not a whole deal, to your brother, is it? Absolutely, yes. Um, I suppose I, I, I would be quite terrible. Uh, even working with Indeed, um, you think that it would be uh, quite quite good with pay per click and SEO, but it's definitely not my my forte, or it wouldn't be something that I would be very comfortable in doing. So it's great that we um, we work together so well. And what, uh, what little tricks do you know that Thomas has that our listeners should be looking at to say to promote my product in, be it Latvia or be it Australia? Any little insights? We love insights. I wouldn't be too up to date with it myself, but I suppose even something that you sent across there, Colin, and um, you know, getting backlinks on your website, yep. um, you know, which are very powerful and important to to ranking you across the world. So, you know, if you're working with some industries out there, some businesses that you have a good relationship with, and it's kind of relevant to what you do, you can always get them or ask them to put some backlinks on their web page, and you can do the same, which I suppose ranks your page a little bit more powerful um, and get you more more leads coming in. So you know, some tips like that and not to be afraid to kind of spend money on your on your marketing. Um, you know, it is an investment at the end of the day, even if you're spending quite a lot. You, once you monitor what you're getting back, it's, uh, it is an investment. And what are people Googling to find you? I'm not too sure, uh, Connell. Um, I'd have to ask the wizard brother that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, if I were looking for, say, um, coffee van, mm. well, is that going to bring me directly or very close to directly to you guys, Dan Rathnew? Yes, it should do, yes. Um, I suppose any of our main kind of products or um, offerings that we have on the site would be pretty much ranked in the SEO. So we do get, we've done a number of projects for coffee units. Uh, as you said, we've done a hairdresser, mobile hairdressers. We've done a mobile stage, uh, bars, full kitchens. They're kind of, they, the possibilities are quite endless really. So, you know, when we first started, you know, a number of years ago, when the clients would be calling in, uh, you'd have clients who were nearly giving us ideas of, uh, of what we could be doing. Um, you know, they were asking, can you do this or can you do that? And, you know, get it's it's always great to, to listen to what the customers are asking you um, because it, 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 you kind of start thinking about what is it that we can do? And you look at all the different angles and extra kind of products you can put on. Um, so it's great to listen to the customers and then being able to, to, to offer it back to what they're looking for, you know. So we love and salute anybody who may have lost a job and decides to set up on their own. If somebody wanted to go in, say, to, to make my life simple, a, once the, um, a sandwich bar, how much would it cost to go to you and get a very nice looking uh, trailer, uh, catering, catering van? Yeah, so I suppose if you're, you're looking to start off at one of our smaller units, um, which will be quite suitable for, you know, one to two staff kind of working in, which is, which is great for startups, um, you know, and if you wanted to fit it out with your standard equipment, your fridges, cooking appliances, you'd be talking starting at about 21,000 XVAT. Um, and then it just increases based on the size and the level of equipment that you're looking to put in. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a big chunk of money, obviously, but in terms of an investment for, you know, starting up your own business, it's relatively small compared to the money that you can pour into some different operations, you know. Um, of course. And what what kind of um, permits do you need? Do, if I want to go off and sell sandwiches, do I need to get HASP certification or anything like that? Do you know? Yes. So um, I suppose one of the key things is if you're looking to set up a business is your location. So uh, if you can get your own private property and, um, you know, if you had land or a garden that was situated on a busy, a busy uh, footfall, you know, especially these days with everybody out doing their walks, you know, and, um, you know, everyone at home and they're just out exercising. You're, you, people are exploring much more. So if you have an area with high footfall, you don't need any permits as long as it's private property. 
But what you will need to do is obviously register with the HACCP. So all of our units are built and designed based on the Environmental Health Officers regulations. So once you get the unit, you just ring up and, you know, you go through your procedures, you'd have your HACCP course, but the unit itself is designed so that, that they will pass it and sign off on it. And, you know, with all the refrigeration, the sinks, the hand wash, everything has been done over a number of years to make it as, you know, you receive the unit and, you know, and get it operational as quick as possible. Oh, 21,000 sounds uh, feasible, particularly, I think Microfinance Ireland can give you 25,000 quid uh, to start with as well. So maybe some of the banks listening might uh, look at the option of doing that. How many units a year are you producing? Um, so for 2021, we're looking at producing about 70 units. Um, and then for 2022, with the new uh, unit in Ballymount and being able to increase their production, um, we're looking at doing about 130 to 140 units. That is a chunky change, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's all exciting. It's really great to see things grow. I suppose one of the things that has me excited is, um, you know, when I'm out, when I'm not working and I'm going traveling or I'm, uh, I'm visiting friends and I can, I can turn around and say, oh, one of my units is not too far away. I can stop in and have a look and see how the customers are operating. And that's kind of my goal is that if, you know, whatever country I go to or whatever holiday I go, I won't be too far from one of our products, which uh, that's what keeps me motivated in selling, you know. And I mentioned that you're anywhere between US and Australia. Anywhere else where Team GBS, that's us, that's our listeners, can we open markets for you and can we do anything else for you as a business? Yeah, so um, we're currently rolling out a number of um, agents um, programs across different uh, European countries. I suppose in countries where English wouldn't be their predominantly speaking language. Um, so we've, you know, we've just gotten taken on board some agents for the Baltic regions. Um, we still deal with Germany ourselves, but we will be looking at taking on some German speakers. We've um, Italian. Um, it's, it's, we've inquiries and we have a lot of customers in, in a lot of different regions that we're, we're, we're looking to reach over the next number you know, next number of months um, or year, next number of years even. And selling Airstream back to the Americans. I love that one. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, we've uh, we've sent some units to Seattle. Um, so these are kind of test units. We've sent two units to Seattle. We sent a couple of units to California. Um, so the units in California have all just been signed off and approved now. So we have a, an agent going live in California the start of Q2. And um, so they are a winery in California um, and they have a huge market already for our products. They have uh, they've a number of clients waiting to receive them. So that's quite exciting. And um, we're just in the final stages of signing everything off then in Seattle as well. That so, all yeah, sounds think- fantastic. Now, with those kind of sales comes one issue and that is finance. Are you fully financed or do you need any help there? Um, we're fully financed. Everything has been kind of organic. Um, you know, we've grown just um, based on um, our own uh, revenue and turnover. Everything we invest back into the business itself. Um, so things are really, really good in that, that area. Um, so we're trying to grow. We're, we're growing rather quickly. But it's, I suppose, doing the most important things first um, and just doing it correctly. I suppose we could have launched and and, and sold units to the US. We could have sold a lot more units to the US, you know, over the last number of months or that. But I suppose it's just getting getting nice, the logistics correct, getting the, the, the quality for each individual state. You know, each state we go to is such a different kind of regulations and certifications. So it's just doing it all in the right speed and making sure everything's correct. So that we can really roll out in, in, you know, the middle of this year. And what I'm going to do for you in the States is I'm going to introduce you to Connecticut. I think uh, I mentioned this to you that I'm involved with the Ireland Connecticut Business Council there. And I will introduce you to them and maybe you could have a little beachhead on in Connecticut, which would be a nice place to be based uh, if you want to spread yourself across the States after that. Kevin, that is a wonderful business story. And uh, later on this year, being 2021, I'm going to come back to you to see how you are getting on, growing, etc. And thank you so much for joining us on thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Brilliant. Thank, thanks very much for having me on, Colin. Uh, really pleasure chatting to you. Thanks very much. Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. That great business show.com is sponsored by DeFactoShave.com. They back us, we back you. 
So please, you back them and buy the world's best shaving oil today. De facto shaving oil is available online at defactoshave.com and delivered worldwide. It's all go like Chrissy Gno on that great business show.com. That great business show. We had already lined up our next guest, Charlie Gleason of the East Scooter Company, Zip Mobility, when in popped a press release about the company sent to us by a big supporter of that great business show, Michal Whelan at UCD's incubator, Nova UCD here in Dublin. Timely or what? Basically, Zip says that they have plans to create at least 30 additional jobs in the coming year and are set to launch e-scooter services across Ireland once new e-scooter legislation is passed into law. The company is currently operating a fleet of 450 e-scooters in the UK, which it expects to increase to 600 units in the coming months. And chatting earlier, Charlie told me he was the class dunce in school, but he's obviously got the smarts as he's already raised 1.1 million euro in funding and is now on the hunt for a truckload more. Charlie Lee and thanks so much for joining us here in our Dublin South FM podcast studios. You said it yourself, Charlie, you went from class clown to knuckling down. What happened? Yeah, I guess, look, I, I would tell you my life story, but uh, I, I suppose it'd be quite short only being 25. So I'll start in school anyway. Um, yeah, look, uh, not unlike uh, a lot of other students, I just kind of never really engaged that much. I was, you know, I literally thought I was too cool for school. I, you know, wouldn't really do much homework and I, I wouldn't show up to class sometimes and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and, you know, I'd say in exams and stuff like that, I'd put the pen down after maybe 20 minutes just because I felt like it. Um, but anyway, look, when, when the leaving cert came around, I kind of, uh, I suppose I realised the gravity of it about three weeks before uh, and uh, just about scraped a pass and everything. Um, and that was, you know, that was unbelievable for me. I was over the moon with straight D's and uh, like, yeah, the first time. So it was great. Yeah. But then um, I guess I got into a level six in DIT, business and man- business management. And uh, I had no intention of going in. I, you know, I was plotting with my mate after my leaving cert that we were both going to, you know, save up a few quid and move to Trinidad. He's Trinidadian and we just thought that'd be a good idea. And uh, after a few mo- after a few months of saving and planning a little bit, you know, not really quite sure what we do. I broke it to my parents and I kind of said, look, I'm planning to move to Trinidad. And uh, they kind of said, OK, well, you know, if you do that and you come home, there's not a house for you, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, so that was a very short lived plan. So, uh, yeah, I started in DIT um and had the same approach to school, really. Like I, I, I wasn't trying very hard, wasn't really showing up. Like a lot of people in first year college, just kind of partying. And uh, I failed the Christmas exams, all of them. And uh, I remember just realizing the gravity of it then. Like, you know, in school, you fail a test and, you know, you just, you carry on with school and you get to the next year. You don't get held back necessarily. And I remember just realizing, geez, if I don't get through this, you know, you, you don't progress. So uh, I kind of knuckled down. I said, okay, I'll, I'll attend class in the second semester. And you know, that was I, very good of you. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I attended class and uh, yeah, I, I, I passed all the, all, all of the exams. And I remember going, wow, you know, there was kind of two things I realized. The first one was, you know, I'm not that stupid. And the second one was that I love business. And um, so that's kind of where it started. And then I, you know, I was studying all over the summer because I had a lot of re- repeats from, from the first semester. Same thing again, passed, couldn't believe it two times in a row. Uh, so then in second year college, you know, I gave it a good bash and anyway, did quite well and moved. Hang on, I, I don't know this part. Okay. How well did you do? I finished, yeah, f- uh, first uh, in the course and then... Uh, you told me you're the class clown, the dunce, and you're now telling me you were first in class. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I suppose I, I didn't really realise it. I'm going to tear up my script. Yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> but no, I moved into into uh, UCD then from there in a kind of back route. Uh, and that's kind of where I convinced myself that I wanted to be an accountant, which was uh, like a lot of people in BCom. Um, nothing wrong with it, but um, yeah, very, very different to what I ever imagined myself doing. Um, and then, yeah, look, and then I kind of, I suppose... In my final year of college, I started reading about this scooter sharing industry. Um, you know, I started reading business newsletters and I heard about this company, Bird, that after two months, they were valued at over a billion. And, you know, they rolled out into 100 cities in their first 12 months. And it, for those of you who don't know, scooter sharing is this uh, service where, you know, you download an app, you locate your nearest scooter, which is going to be dotted around the town or city you're in. You locate your nearest scooter, uh, you scan the QR code located on the scooter, hop on and ride to your destination. Simple as that. 
so I was fascinated by the industry, fascinated by the level of demand as well. Like the uptake was huge. So I thought, you know, this would be an excellent thing to, to bring to Ireland. And I jumped into uh, a, a college module and perfect timing. I had a, a college assignment that was like, you know, what what business would you bring to Ireland and why? And it was a group project and I was with a group of strangers. Uh, one one guy I knew, but mainly strangers. And I, just, I hadn't broken to them that I had this idea about starting a scooter sharing company. So I thought it'd be a great idea for me to get these, you know, new friends to do a little bit market research unknowingly uh, for the business. Exploiting your friends. <laughs> Jesus. So, <laughs> You're yeah. going downhill again. <laughs> so that was the start. And anyway, quickly realised that... Um, you know, e-scooter legislation was behind in Ireland and, and, you know, where a lot of people would see that as, you know, uh, saying, oh, let's close that book. I saw it as an opportunity to get my ducks in a row um, and to get a business plan together uh, so that when the legislation did change, we, we'd be in a very good position to win a licence. So, so that's kind of how it all started. No, because you're leaving out some of the other stuff, like the 1.1 million quid. Where did yeah. that come from? Well, okay, so I suppose to, to answer that question, I might bring you back to where I was. So, um, you know, after college, I finished up, I had a contract with Deloitte. I decided not you to... You passed your exams, I take it. Yes, I passed my exams. Did you yes. get first class honours? No, I got a 2-1. Okay, I was too focused do. on working do. on Zip. So, <laughs> okay, we'll um, allow that. Uh, so, look, I, I finished up college and I took probably a few days off and then went straight into this full time, went into Nova UCD. They've been excellent the whole time. And I, I was working on this full bash um, in various accelerator programs and things like that. And look, when the legislation wasn't around and there was no sign of it moving, the plan was to launch and scale on university campuses and scale that way across Ireland and the UK. Which would be private property, so private the property. law doesn't apply. Exactly, off of public roads. So that way, you know, when the legislation did change, we'd have little pockets of operations all over the place. Um, so that was the initial plan. Um, we moved, well, when I say we, it was myself, uh, we moved uh, with... Um, we moved kind of, you know, with various universities, got a few MOUs signed. It was all going well. And then COVID struck. Uh, and when that happened, um, you know, no university students on campus. At the time, I probably thought it was only till September. And I was like, oh, God, we're going to have to wait till September for this COVID thing to pass. That was last year. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like it was uh, kicking on a little bit longer. In But anyway... So we had a few investors lined up that said, we'll fund the university pilots once the formal contract is signed, right? So that all fell through. But another thing that happened with COVID almost immediately after was the governments realised that public transport capacity was in a lot of trouble and was reduced by 70, 80, 90 percent. So they needed people to move in a way that they've never moved before. So what they did in the UK was that they announced that they were going to legalise e-scooter trials. Now, they weren't going to let anyone ride an e-scooter, but what they did was they allowed local authorities to issue e-scooter sharing licenses to operators if they wish to do so, to get people moving in a different way. So straight away, you know, I had all these investors that had fallen through because of the university, you know, pilots falling through. And I went right back to them and I said, look, scrap that. There's a new opportunity in the UK. This is huge. I've got everything ready to go. Just give me the money and I can do it. Remind me again, what age are you? Uh, tw I was 24 at the time. It's incredible. And now this was this was a smaller amount of money now. Well, it was, it was 300K. And, you know, they said, okay, that all, you know, adds up gave 300k. Uh, I had a kind of, wasn't 100% sure, you know, what to do with it immediately. I think the first thing I did was maybe buy, Party. I think the first thing I did was buy a laptop because I was, you know, um, but yeah, so we quickly hired a couple of people, uh, hired a really good guy, Will O'Brien, he's the, our head of government affairs, but he was fresh out of college, right? And we were sitting down and at the time our, our, our base was, um, our HQ was upstairs in Gleason's of Booterstown in the townhouse. This boy's name is Charlie Gleason. Yeah. You can see the connection. Yeah, so it was it, my, my dad's uh, restaurant, but it was closed down because of COVID. So upstairs, there was a few hotel rooms, one of which we converted into an office. So Will and I were up there and we we're kind of thinking, you know, geez, this is going to be, you know, formal procurement processes, like full on tenders. Uh, and we were like, how are we going to pass these? And we kind of had this idea that, you know, Public procurement tenders, uh, uh, they they follow, or for, formal procurement processes follow marking schemes, okay? And that's how they're graded. And we thought, you know, who better to, you know, nail a tender or nail a marking scheme than students? So we go, okay, let's go to UCD and pick up some recent graduates or undergraduates that, you know, just smash their exams and we'll take them on and, and see what they can do. 
so that was the initial process. And, you know, we thought there was going to be kind of two or three tenders going up over the summer and we'd have nice four weeks to prepare for all of them. That wasn't the case at all. There were, you know, two or three and sometimes four tenders a week that were 16,000 words a piece. So we needed a few more students. Uh, so we got, you know, a nice team of, I think six or six students or so, mainly just coming in for the summer. It was like school or rock or something, um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was. That's how that's how we kind of got started, and we won a few tenders. Now, I suppose just before I go into that, our our team isn't a bunch bunch of youngsters either. We've got a bit of grey matter in there as well. So well, we'll get back to that in a second because sure. I I just think that the idea of getting the guys who can game the marking system and exams is brilliant. Mm. And that's what you did. Yeah, it worked well. Like, you know, we, it, and it's not like we're kind of a dot in the ocean in the UK market. It's complete the complete opposite. We've got a very unique approach, uh, to, not only to the, you know, tender process, but the business model is different as well. But, you know, with that, um, with that different approach, we didn't only, you know, we're not just in the UK market. We're kind of one of the top operators in the UK market. Which, when you said it to me, I said, no. Nah. Yeah, like... And you are. Yeah, like the, the the process that we had, all right? So I started Zip with this idea of bringing Bird, which is the, the first scooter sharing operation, to, to Ireland. That was, the, that was the kind of, you know, bringing this massive company to Ireland. And now we've got a much larger market share than Bird, who are, you know, a unicorn company valued at 2.5 billion, or, or Lime, who are also valued at over a billion. And a few other major, major European players just fell short in the UK. Okay, and it's just, you know, we know what councils want and, and uh, we're kind of pursuing that. And you are now about to raise some further cash. Yes, we are indeed. Is this towards your Tesla? <laughs> not quite, <laughs> not quite. Um, not yet anyway. But yeah, we're kind of, look, we, we've we've raised 1.1. We've, um, you know, we've we've spent a lot of it and we've converted it into revenue generating schemes. And, and what we're trying to do now is we're just trying to do that again, except, you know, three or four times the size. We know exactly what we're doing now. So you're looking for four million odd? Yeah, three to four million is what we're looking for right now. Um, and we're just kind of, you know, as, a, as we like to call it, loading the gun, getting our, you know, materials together and getting ready for this uh, and, and putting the prep materials in. And I'd say the, the real reach outs will start in February and that's when we'll get the ball rolling there. And are you organising this yourself? Are you trying to raise the monies yourself? Uh, we are. Well, we're working. We've got a consultant uh, that we're working with as well, uh, who's done this many, many times. Uh, a good friend of yours, Marco Donovan. I know him uh, well. Yeah. So uh, I, I had a feeling you might bring it up, but yeah, Mark's been absolutely excellent, um, and it's great. Again, just the more people that have done this before, you know, the young guys on the team and the young girls, we've got the enthusiasm. We've got I the can smarts, see that, yeah. and we're going to sprint <laughs> in a direction. And what we need is is the people around us to kind of go, oh, turn a little bit left there and avoid that pothole. Uh, so it's just you know, it, it's the experience with the the energy. I think is is an unstoppable combo. And what are you hoping to achieve? First of all, in Ireland, and then internationally, like the 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 legislation for whatever reason still seems to be stuck in the ether somewhere for no yeah. good reason. Yeah, well, like look, it's it's we're making progress. We've got uh, consultants on that side as well, just helping us with our with our strategy and you know finding out when the legislation is actually moving. Now, what, um, what are you hearing from them? Long story short, that scooters will be available on the streets probably by you know end of March. Uh, oh, that's you know, soon. Okay. Yeah, may, may, maybe April, but like, look, I, I won't bore you with the detail. There's a few factors that are still unknown with COVID and, uh, and you know, the doll and the amount of hours they're sitting in and things like that. But, um, but long story short, we think it's going to be probably April. Now, that's not a shared scheme. That's legalisation. And then it's up to the local councils to actually put out licences, which will probably be, you know, depending on how eager the council's on a little bit after that. Because you will be in direct competition with Moby, for example, who have indeed. been on the uh, that great business show with us as well. Yes, yes, we will indeed, yeah. And how are you going to smash Moby? Oh, it's a, it, look, it's a tough question and I, I don't really want to kind of get into it in too much detail. Remember in school, reasons. fight, 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 fight. Yeah, no, I wasn't a fighter. I was never there. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, look, I think, look, there's a few things that we've got. I think we've got what we like to call a sustainable growth model, which is, you know, we're kind of finding ourselves somewhere in the middle of, you know, launching in a market, staying there, proving the concept and also scaling. We're kind of scaling at a very uh, appropriate level, we think. Um, you know, we look at, the likes of Bird and Lime who scale into 100 markets in a year. We look at Tier and Voy who scale into, you know, 50 markets per year. And one thing that's really kind of uh, not going too well for them, if I may say so myself, is that that level of scale um, means that they don't really give each local authority the time they need to ensure a successful trial or e-scooter launch. Um, and I think 
the first wave of, you know, scooter sharing was just get scooters all over the world. Great. The second was, okay, well, let's actually get permission from the council, but let's still get scooters all over the world. Great. And I think the third wave is slightly different. The third wave is understanding that there's more stakeholders than just the customer. Okay. So there's the customer, the person that uses the service. We've got an excellent product. You know, we've got an excellent scooter. Software is seamless. Excellent. The second thing is, you know, uh, the council. You know, we need continuous, constant engagement with the council to make sure we're doing everything the way they envisage us doing it or providing the service. So that's kind of the second thing. And then the third is is one that we are kind of have a different angle on is the third stakeholder is other, uh, other pedestrians, not users of the service, but you know, the general public, uh, vulnerable road users, whether it's the elderly or people with disabilities or visual impairments, uh, they all need to be considered equally. Um, and, and what we've done around that is, you know, if you look at Bird, Lime, Tier, Voy, all the big guys that I keep mentioning, um, they've got dockless services. So they provide, they pretty much means that you can pick up a scooter from anywhere and drop it off anywhere. And that was one of the criticisms because they were being dumped any which way. Absolutely, yeah. And, and what we do slightly differently is what we've got uh, is virtual parking bays. So what that means is there's literally a slab of paint that looks like a car parking space with a zip logo in it. And there are hundreds of them in every market we enter. And you can pick up the scooters from those parking bays and leave them back in the parking bays. So, you know, it solves a lot of problems. It means that they're a little bit more free floating than docks. They're, there's a lot less infrastructure than the likes of Dublin bikes. But at the same time, uh, you're not cluttering up the streets and you're not blocking the streets. You have been born and raised in Dublin. You know what's going to happen to your duckless bikes in Dublin. They're going to be nicked and they're going to be dumped into the canals or whatever. Ah, Look, there's always an element of vandalism. You know, we've seen it already, um, but it's just about managing that vandalism. And with a, with a, a semi-docked model, like a virtual parking bay model, there is categorically less vandalism than if it's a dockless service and their scooters down every alley. That's the first thing. The second is that, you know, people won't nick them for resale. They'll very quickly realize that these things can't be resold. They're different scooters than the ones you'd buy in Halford. They're, you know, three times as heavy. Um, they don't fold, things like that. So we're not too worried about that. And they're all GPS tracked as well. You hear some very funny stories of people robbing five scooters a night and at the end of the week, they get stung for 35 scooters in a warehouse, you know. So, uh, yeah. Have no, you had that? Uh, we have, our area manager has been knocking on a few doors. He's a six foot nine guy. Uh, he's very, very friendly, but uh, he looks quite scary. So, you know, you don't want to be getting a knock on the door from him and, and uh, you definitely won't be doing it again. So I think people just look, and I'm, I'm not pointing the finger either. Like, I think there's just kind of an element of people not really understanding the service. We're educating them as well as we can. But, um, you know, issues with people riding on the footpath and things are natural at the very start. But it's just about con uh, continuously engaging with the community and just making sure that you're, you're limiting that and you're constantly working to put out press releases on the appropriate ways to ride and all that kind of good stuff. So Maybe you should go back to the old ways when uh, the start of motor cars. You do know that there was a guy out with yes. a red lamp in front. Maybe Absolutely. You need, maybe you need somebody running in front of the scooter with yeah, the red lamp. Yeah, yeah. You could do that. What are the plans for Ireland in total? So look, in summary, um, there's a lot of kind of unknowns in the very, very near future. But what we do, what we want to do is, is fairly certain. We're going to lead the Irish scooter sharing market. Um, and, you know, Dublin is very competitive. Um, and we're going to lead the Irish scooter sharing market with or without Dublin. Um, one of the things that we focus on is smaller markets than a lot of our competitors. And we see opportunities where a lot of other operators don't um, in these kind of smaller areas. Um, Such you know, as, name those names, because Moby told us they are either in or going to Cork and they're going to Waterford. And I think he may have named some other places that he's going. Yeah, well, like scooter sharing mm. operations in, in, in the UK have, have gone to places smaller than Drogheda. So, you know, if, if you... If you set a cap at, you know, 150,000 people, you know, there's not really much wiggle, you know, you're not going to move very far in Ireland, but if you kind of get a little bit lower to that kind of 50 to 100,000 as well, you, you just hit a lot, hit a lot more boxes. Um, you know, I, I do fully believe that we are going to win the Dublin license. We're going to be one of the operators. Maybe it'll be Moby alongside us. Um, there are probably going to be multiple, I would imagine, uh, in a city the size of Dublin. And um, so, yeah, look, I think there's room for both of us. And uh, regardless, they've got their e-bike. So, uh, and great you, company. And you or some of the pals have run the numbers. It mm. makes financial sense. Yeah, like we have extremely lean unit economics compared to a lot of, a lot of our competitors. So, you know, this sustainable Exploiting growth. your friends, is it? No, not quite. No, no, no. Um, but look, we, we have all of our operations in-house. We don't outsource, which is, you know, a killer of a gross margin in a lot of ways. Um, 
We have, uh, you know, a sustainable growth model, meaning that if we're only scaling into five to 10 markets per year, we can really focus on hone in on profitability. Um, you know, we've got swappable batteries as well, which is really, really important for, for your unit economics. Instead of yeah, bringing 20 scooters back to our warehouse or, you know, bringing 100 scooters back to our warehouse every night. We can go out to the scooters in our e-cargo van or e-cargo bikes or e-vans and, uh, you know, just redistribute the batteries that way. So with these really, really strong levels of unit economics, uh, we can either, you know, enter into... We, we can enter into large markets profitably, but the main key thing is we can operate in areas with less demand, i.e. smaller markets. And um, so, yeah, that's our plan. You have had some kind of exciting thoughts. I'm sure your dream is lying in your bed and thinking, good God, this could go huge. Mm. How huge do you think you can go? It's a question, yeah. I've been asked this before by investors as well. It's, it's very, very interesting because... They know, just want to make money. Yeah, everyone's got different <laughs> angles. When do you want to get out? All that kind yeah. of great stuff. But, you know, we're just focusing on what we can do right now. And, you know, we see Zip in the next five years being in, you know, three continents. We plan to have, you know, 10,000 scooters in the next few years. We plan to replace, you know, millions of car journeys every year and, you know, take tens or, you know, hundreds of thousands of CO2 emissions out of the air. So, or hundreds of thousands of tons even. So, um, look, we've got very, very big ambitions and, and we want to get this global. So, uh, that's the plan. So, you will come back to that great business show, hopefully within the year and tell us that you've already gone to maybe one or two other continents. And again, if there's anything that Team GBS can do for you? Is there anything that we can do for you that you need or would like? Opening a market for you, funding, obviously. Anybody who wants to fund, uh, who wants to pay, uh, give you money, they will find you at? Um, I suppose you can find me on my LinkedIn or, or at info at zipmobility.com. Uh, yeah. Very simple name, Charlie Gleason. Look at the very, very top of the results tables in the UCD exams. You'll find them there. <laughs> not quite, not quite. <laughs> and the second thing, is there are there any markets that you really, really would love an opening into? Look, I love the idea of being, um, you know, there's a lot of operators that have come from the States and come into Europe. We want to be, you know, I love the idea and there's no immediate plans for this, but I love the idea of being the first European operator operating in the States. And so, yeah, we are kind of exploring the options. I don't want to say anything too early, but we're, we're, exploring, uh, we're exploring our options in the US at the moment. Please come back and tell us when you are about to launch into the States. <laughs> it's a fantastic story. Your story is fantastic. You are fantastic. Charlie Gleason of Zip Mobility. Thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. Thanks a million for having me. And that is it from thatgreatbusinessshow.com for this episode 17. A huge thank you to Alison O'Dwyer and Peter Rice, our sound engineers here at the incredibly professional Dublin South FM podcast studios. And a big shout again to Jessica Kenny of Wicklow Leo for finding us some wonderful guests for today's program. And thanks to Maeve Neefsey for an incredible work on our marketing this week, where we broke our records on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Do, do, do follow us on our LinkedIn pages. That's where we give you, uh, our listeners and our followers, sneak peeks and some further insights into our guests and into that great business show. So from me, and I cannot ask my sidekick, Mr. Heastlip, to have his final word, but on his behalf, I'm saying, Kurov Mahagov, Slam.